Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 316, featuring the first in a two-part series of interviews with Mr. Johnny Wood, the lead engineer of Turbine, at Turbine, <laughs> where he worked on games like Lord of the Rings Online, as well as Dungeons and Dragons Online, and uh, many other projects. Uh, but what I'm mostly excited about here, though, is his work on a, basically a side project that he's done called Classic Ultima Online. This is a free program that lets you play the first four Ultima games in an online uh, multiplayer format. It's really, really cool, and I know you guys would want to hear uh, more about it. Uh, in this first part, we'll talk just about that uh, Classic Ultima Online program. In the second one, we'll get more into the, his uh, work at Turbine and what he thinks about the MMORPG scene. Uh, lots of uh, interesting stuff coming up. Anyway, we've got a lot to cover here, so without further ado, here's Johnny! Hi folks, I am here with Johnny Wood. Johnny is the lead engineer on the Dungeons & Dragons Online MMORPG, works at a, uh, Turbine Incorporated. He's also the developer behind a project called Classic Ultima Online. This is a free online modern remake of the first four Ultimas using the RUM construction kit. As you can probably tell from the name, this is online with a cool multiplayer capabilities and uh, several other uh, really neat features that I hope we can get into. Uh, how are you today, Johnny? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Uh, before we get into the classic Ultima Online, I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about what it is about Ultima uh, that got you so interested in that in developing something like this. Mm -hmm. uh, Ultima uh, would have to be probably the first RPG I ever played uh, way back uh, in 1985 on the Commodore 64. Um, a friend of mine actually got the game, and at first I, I was very confused by the game. It was outside yeah, I think of everybody Atari. was <laughs> <laughs> outside of Atari 2600. It was the most complex video game I'd, I'd seen at the time, and uh, I just had so many questions. I kept asking him, "Why? Well, first of all, why are you playing this game? It's weird. And uh, what are you? What are you doing? Why are you walking around and talking to people?" and uh, once I, it kind of clicked and I, I got the, the gist of it all, I was just blown away by the scope of the world and uh, everything. And I, I fell uh, in love with the game. And years later, when I started programming and realized I could actually get into the industry, and uh, I, I wanted a side project, just something I could try to recreate uh, just to learn programming and everything. So that's... What I picked, I, I actually thought it was a small game, and I had no idea of the real <laughs> scope of the thing until I tried to, to emulate it. I was playing around with it earlier today, and I was able to log in without any problems. Uh, one awesome. thing I thought was cool was how you've got three different tile sets built into that. I, mm -hmm. you know, I was switching. I was, I was having some fun looking at, I guess that's the, the latest one, is that's the Ultima, what do they call that, the E or U7 or something like that project? Uh, the tile set. The Are you talking about the tile set already in the game? Yeah, the, the, the default one looks really slick. I, know, I'm, I was wondering, right. I'm not sure what version that is. That is actually a tile set created by uh, a man named Josh Steele. Uh, it's just what I think most people call the v, VGA tile set. Um, it's something he added later that a lot of... Ultima fan projects have used, um, like at Chief 4 um, and many others. But uh, uh, the three I provide by default is Josh Steele's uh, tile set. I also provide the, the PC EGA tile set and the Commodore 64 tile set. And, and there are many others that I would really like to uh, have provided, but uh, maybe someone else can do that at some point. So what would you say is the the coolest innovations that you've you've added to the original Ultima game interface? Uh, innovations. Uh, gosh, I'm not I'm not sure anything's really innovative. I mean, I've added oh, I've added some. Yeah, multiplayer. Um, but I mean, there there always has been Ultima online, and uh, I just that that's actually one thing I didn't care too much about 
uh, going back into Ultima 4, Ultima 5 even, um, you had to control a lot of characters. In Ultima 4, you had a party of eight. And uh, a lot of times you would go into combat and one of your characters or two of your characters wouldn't have long-range attack abilities and they just became dead weight. Um, just to have to move that person around and get them positioned where they could do combat. And when you finally did, combat was over. It was just a, a lot of work to do a single battle. And I, I just thought, hey, it, it would be great if you could actually play this game with eight people, each controlling their own person. Uh, things would go so much quicker and uh, just be a lot of fun. So have you been able to hook up with seven other people and try this uh, out? Years ago, when... Uh, so the original... CUO was released back in, uh, I want to say 2006. It may have actually been 2004. Uh, interest in the project was a lot higher back then. I'm not sure why, but uh, there was actually a huge uh, Finland player base, I think. Uh, a lot of people from there logging in and playing. And um, I, I would. I would jump on. I would teleport to the players, talk to them, play around. Uh, had a lot of fun with it back in the day. These days, uh, of course, I, get, I guess I should say that we took the... Uh, there were three servers up originally back in 2006, and that, that quickly dwindled down to one. Uh, a guy named Dennis DeMarco, I should uh, mention him, he kept that original classic Ultima Online server going for years and years and years. I think... We finally brought it down in 2011, 2012, uh, and only recently have uh, we put it back up for the um, to celebrate the 30th anniversary of Ultima 4. Uh, we uh, I, I had a few requests, a few uh, little uh, bits and pieces of interest from people. They would email in and ask me what's the state of the project. Uh, it had pretty much been discontinued for a couple of years and. Uh, we just uh, decided, hey, let's put this thing back up and let people play it if there's still an interest in it. And uh, so we sent out some feelers. Uh, David Beatty of Megawars.net, he agreed uh, to put up a server. So on September 15th, which is the uh, 30th anniversary of Ultima 4, uh, we got it back up and going. And uh, unfortunately, there, there hasn't been a whole lot of interest, but I'm, I'm not really sure that uh, people really know about it just yet. It may take a while. Well, I'm sure some of the people from this watching this video now will be curious and want to try this out because I know there's a lot of hardcore Ultima types <laughs> uh, that watch so. this show. I mean, is that mostly the people that were playing it were really hardcore Ultima fans, or were you uh, attracting people that hadn't played the originals? Uh, I think most of them were. And uh, taking a look at a lot of the chat log history and things like that, I could tell that a lot of people there were very familiar with Ultima 4. People who were not at all familiar with Ultima, they would log in for a few minutes, say something like, this game is stupid, and then log out. <laughs> that would be oh, it. Must You'd have cried every time that happened. No, I, I completely understand. If you did not grow up in and around this style of game, then it's, I mean, there's just a uh, an ocean of <laughs> difference between that kind of game now. Yeah, it's pretty intimidating. I was just thinking, like, all the keyboard shortcuts you have to know and all that kind of thing if mm -hmm. you didn't have the i guess you need to have a, a printout of the command sitting around somewhere oh certainly yeah yeah just remember i think the original one had i don't know i must have had like 30 something commands right there were there there was basically a command for every letter of the alphabet and if i'm not mistaken there might have been a couple of extra commands where you could hit control Alt or uh, Shift, maybe, to access some of those commands. Well, it says here that some of the things that you've added are some uh, diagonal movement mm -hmm. and the ability to attack diagonally. <laughs> yeah, how big of a difference does that make? Uh, not much. Uh, there were a few places in the game where if you could have moved diagonally, you could cheat. You could get to areas where you weren't supposed to get to. We kind of had to go in and, and uh, fill in some of those positions. Um uh, but for the most part, it, it, it was just funny because in the original, you could not move diagonally or attack diagonally, but most of your enemies could. Um, and <laughs> that just seemed a bit unfair, yeah. so I, I just thought, hey, that should definitely be added. I wonder why, what was up with that. Why, why did he design it that way, I wonder? 
I, I imagine it was a limitation of either the Apple II or Commodore 64. Uh, I mean, even modern PC games, you look down at your, your arrow keys and you've only got four of them. It's not like really set up for diagonal movement. Um, if you use the numpad, certainly, uh, which CUO actually supports, is uh, it, it really uh, prefers that you use the numpad for movement. And by the way, there is no mouse support or anything like that. I wanted to keep the experience as close to the original as I could um, without, you know, a- adding some new aspects, but at the same time, you know, not, not getting carried away and making it a completely new game. Hmm. Yeah, I was going to, I was going to ask you about that actually, if there were plans to <laughs> <laughs> graft on some uh, mouse controls or at least maybe a screen that would pop up and show you the, the commands. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, it's something I wanted to do. It's just something I never got around to and probably guess, never will. It's kind of a moot point nowadays anyway, right? Cause you right. can just bring it up on a, Everybody's got multiple screens and everything. You can have the, mm-hmm. the manual up on the other side there. Sure. Uh, and also I noticed uh, top-down dungeons. Mm-hmm. So as I recall, I don't remember which one I switched to that, but weren't maybe I know the first one, was it the, did the fourth one? When did he switch to the, did they all have those uh, first-person dungeons, or when did they? Okay, so Ultima Four had uh, a mixture of those. Okay. So when you when you first went into a dungeon, it was a pseudo 3D style dungeon, and then you had uh, up to eight dungeon rooms per level. And when you went into a dungeon room, that would switch to a t- 2D combat screen, basically. So that was top down. Um, and I believe, yeah, Ultima Five was very much the same way, and I think Ultima Six was the first word that got completely rid of the 3D aspects. The reason I got rid of 3D for CUO is that with a party of eight people, uh, you would be bumping into each other, uh, completely unaware where your other you know party members were. Um, the dungeons are actually fairly small in Ultima Four, so. Uh, taking one icon that represented eight people and actually turning that into eight people that would uh, cover a considerable amount of real estate as far as the dungeon went. So uh, I just decided to drop 3D, and I, I was actually never too crazy about the 3D dungeons in Ultima anyway. <laughs> I think you, I know you watched that video I did with the uh, Lord British. I guess mm-hmm. yes, <laughs> I think like he was uh, really proud of that achievement back on the. Yeah, and, and, and it's a totally path. I guess he did that right from the to get go. Right. Yeah. Basic, I, I guess. I think most of his original work was in assembly language. Mm. Uh, no, actually, I think he he did mention basic, and then he moved to assembly, and then from there, I think it was C plus plus. Yeah, he's an ambitious guy. You know, he'd always learn something new and then want to implement it right away in <laughs> the next big publication. Right. Uh, so notice. You, you says you've added some new quests or mini quests. Uh, you know, <laughs> did you feel like you were tampering with the uh, greatness there? How do, how do you feel? About um, that? yeah, well, yeah, I was a little timid, uh, to begin with because I, like I said, I didn't want to change what I didn't have to, uh, about the game. Um, and surprisingly Ultima four, uh, and maybe I'm giving Richard Garriott way more credit than maybe he felt, feels like he deserves at the time. But I feel like Ultima 4 really was made for a multiplayer experience because I almost I didn't have to change any dialogue whatsoever for the game. Um, and I, I felt like I would have to change some things like that to to put people into a multiplayer setting. But surprisingly... I didn't really have to change much of anything. Hmm. Um, I wonder if he was whether, already even at that point thinking about an online. Possibly, knowing Richard Garriott, possibly. I mean, he, he's very forward-thinking. Um, he could have already had something going there as far as that's concerned. Um, I wouldn't put it past him. But um, for the side quests, though, what I realized was, um, so in Ultima 4, you have to find a rune to get into a shrine and and you typically find that hiding somewhere in a city on hidden you know on the floor like thrown into a corner and i was was (laughs) was like like the one thing i really remember from that game was looking for those things (laughs) right but i i was kind of thinking really uh there 
okay, so for every player who plays the game, they're going to find a rune stone lying in the corner of a town somewhere. What is there a pile of two million of them, and you just walk up and take your rune and, and walk away? And uh, in reading some of the NPC dialogue, I, I felt like I had remembered uh, one of the NPCs mentioning that they were a rune carver, that they carved runes for entry into the shrines. And I said, yeah, let's let's go with that. So I made it to where you uh, you have to talk to a rune carver. They send you on a side quest um, that has something to do with the virtue. So, for instance, uh, for the uh, compassion rune, you actually have to do a, a quest out of compassion. Um, for humility, uh, there's a you know a test of your humbleness and uh, things like that. And they, they basically send you out to fetch some type of material to bring back so they can carve a rune out of that material to allow you entry into the shrine. And they're, they're very uh, minor additions to the game. And uh, actually, some of the feedback I got from those side quests was, uh, I don't know, very humbling, actually. Um, some people said, wow, you know, the, these add so much more to the virtue experience of the game and they felt like the original game should have had something like that in it uh, so it was very i was very pleased to hear that yeah, it sounds like it's right in line with what should have been there it doesn't seem in any way to be uh mm-hmm. you know out of place or anything right you ever had a lord british or try this out or <laughs> send you a, well, a note i <laughs> I don't know. I, I did meet Richard Garriott uh, one evening. I worked at uh, Midway Games, and he came along with a few other people to give a presentation at Midway. Um, and his talk, of course, was uh, about the virtue system, uh, maybe some other things, uh, if I'm not mistaken. He, he was actually uh, working on uh, Tabula Rasa at the time. But uh, which I unfortunately never got to play. By the time I got around to wanting to give it a shot, it was gone already, unfortunately. But uh, I actually enjoyed that game. I don't. I was yeah. surprised that it just went away so quickly. I, I hate that games like that can just suddenly disappear and, and be gone forever. Now uh, that's one bad thing about multiplayer games is uh, you may never get to experience that game ever. Uh, but I. I did. I spoke to him after his speech. Uh, I told him about the project, which he seemed genu- genuinely interested in. He uh, he had me write down the web address of the project. Whether he played it after that, I have no idea. But uh, he seemed to have uh, liked the idea. Are and, you supporting uh, in the uh, Shroud of the Avatar? Oh, yeah. yeah. I, I'm definitely I, I helped kickstart it. Uh, that and the uh, new um, Ultima Underworld project. Mm-hmm. There was a bunch of Ultima stuff coming back. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's see. So what? what is this uh, rum? <laughs> rum. Uh, it was, I had a hard time finding anything <laughs> about this. Uh, that's probably because I doubt any of it exists online. That was actually a framework I was trying to build. Uh, if you recall uh, the Adventure Construction set on Commodore 64... Mm-hmm. Uh, my goal was to provide something like that, but, uh, you know, updated for modern times, of course. And what I had hoped it would be was a go-to framework for anyone looking to create or recreate any type of classic RPG, um, be it tile-based, uh, uh, roguelike or mod. And that's actually what RUM stands for, roguelike slash Ultima slash mud. So it's got the built-in. If you want to make an online, multi, massively multiplayer roguelike, that would be your, mm-hmm. your go-to. Right. And, and as far as roguelike goes, it's, you would create tiles that just look like ASCII graphics, uh, and it would be pretty much fully supported. Well, if and, people uh, want to try this classic Ultima online out, you know, how can they do that? And <laughs> you know, If they really enjoy it, is there some way they can support you or... Or what needs to happen to move this forward? Uh, so I actually haven't really given, uh, put much work into the uh, the project at all for a good while now. Um, what I hope to do eventually, and I just need to really just sit down and do it, is uh, upload 
all of the source code and project files and uh, all that stuff to some type of public repository and let people have at it. Um, uh, I don't really have any donation information on the website or anything like that. Um, this is just something I I did just to learn the program, um, specifically MMOs. I mean, and uh, as far as I can tell, it worked. I, you know, I did land a job in the industry. I do work on MMOs professionally now. So um, they actually took your experience with this into consideration then. Mm-hmm. That's cool. I hope. Uh, but to play the game, all you got to do is visit the website. It's www.shatteredmoon.com. Uh, go to the download page. Uh, click on the download button. What you will actually get there is not the classic Ultima Online project. You will get uh, the ROM portal, which is, uh, you can kind of think of that as a extremely stripped down Steam client. Uh, so what that does is it gives you the avenue to download any game that is built off of the ROM framework. And of course, seeing as how ROM is really not available, uh, there is only the classic Ultima Online project you can download, but once you click on that icon and download the game, uh, then it'll move uh, classic Ultima Online from the available section to the downloaded section, and all you got to do from there on out is, is click on that to launch the game. And uh, you that get the Ultima Four for free from GOG, right? That's right, and uh, the classic Ultima Online does require you to have the original game installed somewhere on your machine. Um, and if you want to, and I'm, I'm not actually sure that anyone has ever discovered this, um, but Classic Ultima Online pretty much fully supports Ultima 1 through Ultima 4. So uh, all you got to do is talk to Lord British in Ultima 4. Uh, if you mention Mondane, Minax, or Exodus... Uh, in the original game, he would just say something like, Mondane is dead. But uh, in this version, he will he will say, Mondane is dead, would you like to hear the tale? Oh. And, uh, if you say yes, then your game will transition to Ultima 1 mode, for instance, and uh, you can play fully through Ultima 1 with friends, Ultima 2, Ultima 3, and there are some, you know, like I did with Ultima 4, there are some minor differences, but for the most part, it's Ultima 1 through 4, as you know it. That just sounds awesome to me. So somebody could get a group of friends together and play through the whole Ultima all the way up through uh, the fourth game. Up through four. Then the, I mean, if, if someone, and I think it would be awesome if someone did this, but you know, someone could go in and add Ultima 5. And, uh, and what I'd really, really love to see is an, a, a tile-based Ultima 6, 7, 8. Mm -hmm. I think that would be great to see something like that made with uh, the legacy style Ultima look rather than an isometric tile set. Uh, what I was actually really hoping to see was uh, Linux support, um, Mac support, mobile support would be awesome. Um, I think the, uh, the RUM framework is, is set up to be extremely portable. Uh, I made sure absolutely every third party API or SDK that I used had some type of, um, you know, universal support. Um, I, I would like to see more tile sets added. Um, the, uh, there's a, a tile set from uh, what's called FM Towns. I would love to see that in the game. Oh, yeah. It's a Japanese machine, right? Right. Uh, Josh Steele uh, recently published another tile set that he had finished about, uh, I don't know, I think there's about 80 to 90% of it he had completed. Uh, I think it'd be great to see that in the game. Um, just general improvements. Adding mouse support actually would be awesome. Um maybe some on-screen help and things like that, because it, it is a bit of a hurdle for someone to get into the game. I actually see a lot of downloads for the game, but nowhere near the equivalent amount of people playing the game. So I think a lot of people never make it past creating an account and getting into the game because maybe they just 
do not understand the interface. And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. I should be back next week with the part two of this interview. We'll get into uh, Johnny's work at Turbine and lots of cool insider <laughs> insider information about those uh, uh, MMOs that he's worked on there. So stay tuned. Lots of really interesting stuff coming up. As always, I want to thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you very, very, very much for your support of the show and what we do here at Matt Chat. Really means a lot to me, guys. And if you want to be a patron of the show, that only costs uh, one buck per episode. And you'll really be stepping up to the plate and helping uh, to keep these interviews and episodes coming. So uh, thank you one and all. I want to say a special shout out to uh, new patron Harry Jokinen. I think that's probably not how you pronounce his last name, but uh, I'm sorry, uh, Harry. Uh, anyway, uh, not only is Harry a patron of this show, but he's actually doing his own uh, Patreon uh, project, uh, Patreon funded projects, the action RPG called Neurotron. It looks really interesting, and I'll post a link to this in the show notes if you would like to uh, go check it out. So thank you very much, Harry. All right, what about that news from the Matt Cave? So a couple of interesting items here in the for the news today. We've got these steam machines coming out after a, a long, uh, long, lengthy period of anticipation. Uh, Alienware has one. Uh, that's probably the one that's getting the most attention, but there's also a couple other units. A Zotac Indian steam machine. Uh, it looks like the reviews that I have been finding weren't, weren't all that enthused. Seems to have a, kind of a mixed reception uh, for various reasons. I haven't got a chance to play around with one, so I was going to ask you guys, if, if any of you guys have one of these steam machines, I'd really, really like to hear your, your thoughts on it. So please uh, mention that in the comment section and let me know what you think about your steam machine. Of course, the other big game news item is Fallout 4. Uh, I've already put 15 or so hours into it, really enjoying it. Uh, I've had a few little problems with the, the graphics. Not sure if that's because it's their fault or something on my end, but uh, other than that, been having a lot of fun with that. Uh, I think if you like the Fallout 3 uh, game, you'd probably like this one too. Although I don't, I don't feel like I've played it enough to really to have much to say about how well the story uh, holds up compared to New Vegas or anything like that. But uh, I'll just say this, I'm having fun with it so far and looking forward to getting more into it. So anyway, my favorite bit of news though, have to be ancient rats the size of dogs. <laughs> you guys know me pretty well because I got two or three people uh, that sent this in to me. Uh, so basically, as far as I can see from reading these uh, pieces, uh, there's a giant rat, it's a real thing, and it lived alongside uh, humans. It lived, or it coexisted at the same time, I guess I should say. It looks like the humans uh, killed them off, possibly. They're not really sure, I guess, what happened to, the, to these uh, giant rats, but anyway, how cool is that? So all these years you've been playing these RPGs with the giant rats and probably had no idea this was <laughs> that actually uh, were a real creature. Uh, so that is super cool. You know, I wish that if we, you know, I wish we had a Jurassic Park like situation where we could bring these things back uh, so they could live in my basement, and make my life a lot more adventurous. All right, I guess that will do it for the news. All right, what about that ale of the week? Uh, well, this week I've got a real treat. Uh, this is the uh, one of my favorite breweries, Stone, has put out the depth, depth charged double bastard. Uh, so they've got a double bastard, and this is a special form of that called the depth charged double bastard ale brewed with espresso beans. Uh, so we're going to get some kind of coffee flavors in this one, I would think. Let's see, thirteen looks like thirteen percent alcohol. Uh, so definitely on the stronger side. And I don't usually care much for the write-ups on these bottles, but this one, I, I have to read this. It's, it's a lot of fun. So, uh, so, your knowledge of café is such that you've correctly determined that depth charge refers to the addition of espresso roasted coffee beans. Well, bully for you. For all I know, you picked that up hanging out at some coffee mega-chain amid a microcosmic mismatch of vapid layabouts, <laughs> metro hipsters, and laptop sporting exhibitionists trying to convince the world and themselves 
that they're click clacking out the great American novel come screenplay for a future summer blockbuster. I could surely teach you a thing or two were I inclined, which I am not. <laughs> uh, perhaps you're eyeing my backside because you're really into coffee. Nothing wrong there, but if you've come to me expecting some beery incarnation of your security blanket, me time, soy frappolatte, <laughs> or a similarly uh, dainty concoction, uh, you're in for some grande-sized disappointment. I do not exist to provide a comforting mode of conveyance for your jittery, caffeinated fantasies. Nothing about me is smooth, subtle, or built for comfort. Those who should be holding the bo this bottle en route to opening and indulging in what awaits within are really in to me. Get your cinemocchino fix elsewhere. This here is strictly for adult men who don't require the culinary crutch of added fat and sweeteners. My motto, bold and brave or not at all. Now with a write-up like that, this had better be a really great ale, right? I mean, I love that. Anyway, let's get this double bastard depth charged open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this depth charged double bastard here in this rather excellent drinking horn. I've been smelling it and really enjoying the aroma of this. He definitely has that espresso bean sort of coffee aroma going on here. Kind of a cherry, chocolatey, bourbon aroma as well. It smells uh, really, really nice, but uh, let's give it a taste. You definitely taste that espresso. I mean, that's the first thing that really just jumps out at you. Uh, the aftertaste, you get sort of a cherry, a bourbon-like quality, a little bit of a smoky uh, flavor there. It's uh, quite nice, quite smooth. A little bit of bitterness there. I'll try, uh, try it again. It's almost like he just grabbed a handful of those chocolate espresso uh, beans and just chewed them up real quick and swallowed it. And you know, you get a lot of that sort of flavor, uh, followed by kind of a slightly bitter uh, bourbon-like quality, kind of a scotch-like uh, taste to that. Uh, quite, quite nice, actually. I'll try it one more time. Yeah, I mean, it's it, for, if you like the coffee, uh, <laughs> um, the, the espresso uh, taste, I guess you'd really, really like this one. Uh, I gotta say though, I'm kind of leaning more towards just their regular Double Bastard, which is uh, one of my favorites, but uh, if you want that extra uh, espresso element, this would be right up your alley. They didn't overdo it, and it balances out quite nice. So I think I'm gonna go five out of five drinking horns on this. Normally don't go for these sort of coffee beers, but this is one of the best ones I've had. Uh, so if you see this, uh, Double Charged, or Depth Charged Double Bastard, now go ahead and pick it up. I think you will enjoy it. All right, so let's wrap this up with a quotation. And of course, thinking about Ultima, you're always thinking about the virtues. And I found uh, one, a quote here by Confucius, who I believe uh, a Lord British actually told me that he was a, a fan of, had read a lot of his work. Anyway, it goes something like this. <laughs> and it sounds like something you see in the Ultima games as well. Anyway, <clears throat> the superior man thinks always of virtue. The common man thinks always of comfort. <laughs> so see you guys next week. I will tell you one game that if you buy it and play it, I will kill you. Uh, Pools of Radiance, Ruins of Myth Draenor. Do you, you don't have to kill him, Matt. Not, He'll die from playing it. Do not play this game. Do not be fooled by the Pool of Radiance title. This is a catastrophe <laughs> game. I mean, you will hate yourself. You will... Okay, great. Well, you will despise life <laughs> if you it's, play it's, this. It's terrible. It is awful, awful bad.
It actually could possibly delete your hard drive. And no, I, I, I think not. more than likely it's more than likely to give you cancer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to run, but thanks. It was a great show. I'll send you a copy of it for uh, Christmas. <laughs> a signed copy. <laughs>